Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Jory Graham, discussing her book, Runaway, New, po New Poems, in conversation with Jericho Brown. Tonight's event is part of our ongoing virtual event series. As we remain digital for the time being, we're so excited to continue the work of bringing authors and their writing to our community during these difficult times. Especially now, it is with the support of authors and our beloved community that we are able to make events like this happen. So thank you so much for continuing to show up. This event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A button wherever it may live on your Zoom display, where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section of this presentation, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copy of Runaway. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to the series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation button. We greatly appreciate any and all support you are able to extend us at this time. And lastly, as you may know, if you've participated in large virtual gatherings lately, technical issues might come up. We apologize in advance for that. If any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Jory Graham is the Boylston Professor of Oratory and Rhetoric at Harvard University. The author of numerous collections of poetry, including the Pulitzer Prize winning The Dream of the Unified Field, Graham and her stunning work have received countless other accolades, including the Forward Prize for Best Collection, a Whiting Award, a MacArthur Fellowship, and the Wallace Stevens Award from the Academy of American Poets. Jericho Brown is an associate professor and the director of the Creative Writing Program at Emory University. He is the author of the poetry collections, Please, The New Testament, and most recently, the internationally acclaimed The Tradition. I hope I speak for everyone in the audience presently when I say that it was an absolute delight. In a year where delight is incredibly hard to come by, to see the tradition honored this past April with the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. Thank you for joining us this evening, Jericho, and congratulations again. Tonight, these two brilliant poets will be discussing Jory's latest collection, Runaway, an oracular and effusive catalog of the vanquished past, our ever annihilating present and the unwelcoming future we are daily creating. In these poems, Graham's fluent voice hurdles us through the most treacherous cataracts of our daily existence, deftly navigating the powerful currents of uncertainty in order to radically reimagine a more habitable world. I will end with an observation from Jeff Gordner, who says that runaway feels as though it has been written for right now, especially as we find ourselves in the midst of a pandemic, but also for a target audience that might emerge 100 years on. For decades, Jory Graham has been a dazzling and essential figure in our culture, and it is a great honor to be able to help guide her continued work into what is hopefully a brighter future. We're so honored to host this event tonight. Without further ado, I will now turn things over to Jory and Jericho. Thank you. And uh, thank you for that, Ben. And hi, Jericho. Um, this is obviously uh, an event I've attended often in person at the Harvard Bookstore. And so I was hoping that we could make sure to buy our books from independent bookstores. So um, uh, we are here tonight, to, if you're in the US, to buy this book um, or this book. A phenomenal book, which uh, if you don't own, is absolutely essential reading of Jericho's. And if you're tuning in from the UK, it, this is the UK edition, which has a very cool cover as well. So. Please, it's, uh, you know, we vote with our meager dollars when we buy what is now considered slow moving literature, philosophy, um, poetry, criticism, um, anything that's not bestsellers, which uh, publishing is moving towards inexorably. And uh, so it's uh, important to keep our culture alive through the, I mean, my feeling is buy a book of poetry whenever you can afford one. If you don't like it, give it to the first person you meet on the street. Um, they might like it. They can pass it on. Um, so tonight I'm going to start by just reading a poem which I, um, which Jericho asked me to read. And um, I'm just going to read three poems and then uh, 
have the enormous pleasure and uh, to, of to talking with Jericho and taking audience questions if, if uh, that works out. This is titled Thaw. I can talk about it later. I would say that this seems as I was just saying like a poem written exactly for this moment, but whatever moment you are in, it already had all its precursor moments um, that the imagination intuits so long before you ever get to um, the, um, the moment in which it seems relevant. So this poem, which seems to be entirely about this pandemic, the inability to touch each other, what it was to remember the gaze of a stranger, um, is actually was written uh, quite a while back. And uh, so the idea of thaw, which is in the title, has something to do if you think about, um, you know, the, the moment in which we, not only in which our polar ice caps and everything else is thawing, which actually is supposed to be a moment in the spring, which is a moment of rejuvenation and uh, return to, uh, to spring itself, um, has now become a sort of terrifying moment in terms of the thawing of the permafrost, which gives us the methane and everything else that we're familiar with. But also there's a way in which the human soul has to thaw again into something like forgiveness or something like a kind of a capacity to feel beyond one's, um, the self that one has created in order to survive this period. So it, one has to remember that when, if one gets frostbite, the most painful moment of thawing is the moment when it begins and your fingers begin to um, uh, lose their numbness. But that's the same, um, that's the same pain that it takes when you approach um, forgiveness, whether it's of an other or yourself. Thaw. There's a plot in the back of my building, not the size of the asteroid, not what four hypercrenulations of a reef would have held when there were reefs. It's still here. I must not get the time confused, the times. There is a coolness in it which would have been new spring I can't tell if it's smell as of blossoms, which would have been just then beginning, or of loam. Though this green sensation is a thing which threads and pushes up. What is it pushes it? Whatever pushes it, we must not get the feelings confused. The feelings of this, in this, now, one of us looks in the field guide. One of us looks up to where the sky had been. Our prior lives press on us. Something with heavy recollection in it presses. Not history anymore, of course, but like it. Is it five minutes or 500 years? Can we pencil that in next to the ash heap, the windowless classroom, or what we still call classrooms, out of habit, which feel as the monitors speak like they're filling with snow. Each creature sits alone is that what it is, a creature? It feels like a resurrected thing, this sensation I have of a creature. I carry certain stains with me. I can imagine loneliness, which is an error I know. I think of causes and effects, which is a form of regret. I imagine this veil shall be lifted again and something like a face in a mirror appear. And it will be me, it will be a room as rooms used to be to us and us in them. 
as a family or as lovers. We shall be lifted and we shall touch in the old way. Just a hand on another, not meaning that much, but still a small weight with meaning. A feeling of harboring inside, which reminds one of having a mind. A feeling that one could die, for instance. So there was mystery, hope, fear, loneliness. A sudden alarm from not knowing and being startled by an incomprehensible terror or some other reaction to change. There was change. A person could become. You could look into a face and not know. There was rain and you would hardly notice. It could rain for hours. The face would be there inside its otherness, the way its body, which you could not imagine the inwardness of, moved. Each one moved differently, completely differently. Why is it you now summon streets, how they ran everywhere away? You could be in a strange place and not know. You could be lost. You could be as if thrown away from the real, a trembling thing, a journey. Lost, yes, but not wrong in being. And from there you could see a face which was a stranger. And it would have a look which you had to wait for because it was its look. Because you could not program it or request it because it was not yours, not yours. And when it came your way, like a strange turning, it brought a gaze with it, an expression, a thing given to you you had not made or owned or seen before. That's all. You do not know how to go on from here. You do not know how to imagine further into the past. You want to remember what it was to see a look. There is one look among all the unprogrammable looks you want to recall. You raise your hands to your face to feel for it. Can you force it? It was like this. Someone turned your way. It was a free turn. It was made by them freely. And what they did then was this. You had done something. You seemed to become unmasked. You had done something you should not have done. You felt in you that you wished you had not. And they did something with their free face. They tossed it out at you. A thing not yours to dial up or own. A thing free, a free thing. They forgave you. You are not sure you know what this means, but you are sure this happened once. You were a thing that required it. And it was a thing which was not exact, not on time, not wired in, which was able to arrive in time, just in time, and could be given.
And I'm, I'm going to read a, um, a little bit more um, hopeless one and then a short one, which I guess I believe to be hopeful. Um, hard to be these days. So nice of all of you to come to a poetry reading when you, we all could be wondering what the steroids are doing now. And steroids running the nuclear codes. Really a nice moment. You thought you'd be there in history, did you? I didn't. Okay, this is called From the Transients. And uh, sort of uh, pretty essential to one of the problems of the book. It's in quatrains. And the other poem had a right-hand margin. Not that we can discuss all that tonight, but it's important to me. From the transients. May I help you? No. In the mirror? No. Look, there is still majesty, increase, sacrifice, night in the flat pond, moon in it, on it, disposing entirely of mind. No. Look, there is desert where there was grassland. There is sun inundation like a scrupulous meditation, no message, just mutter of immensity where it leaks into partiality, into you, me. Our boundaries now in the epic see-through. How they elude wholeness, let in illusion, pastness, whole years in a flash, then minutes that do not end, that desert, that jungle. No, you say, no world, swamp, reeds, grassy shapes, beginnings of endings. No, you say, staring right back at event. It keeps turning. No, that will not be the shape I am. It is again. It just was. The shape it was was never the shape it was. Sharpness is melding into blur. Used to be the sublime. Used to be the present tense. Seat of the now dissolved now. No. Myself, my one oneself, isn't working for me. I flaps its empty sleeves. Habit stares at the four horsemen from the end's endlessly festooned terrace. It stares, bullets whine. I dreams of being a girl, a man, of wearing hooves, of being just sweat and whinnying. I smears itself with hope, fear, disorder, opinion, leaves a trail of, what is it of? A smear of beginning, of circles about to close. The manes are tossing in the light. No. Do not trust what I see. Do not trust you. Do not trust my own saying of the not trust. Do not trust world, the no place into which I place my no, the state of mind into which I must clamp my mind. These objects which do not exist. No, do not in the actual, which depart from reality. 
swim against current, my opacity, my soul horrors. Swim hard against the current state of, may I touch the place that is you? No. Would you have had a place once? Yes. Is there a present tense now? No. What is there? Touch it. This place where we share this mind, it will be our first and last. Our first and last what? Our first and last. Did we live among men? Were we mouthpieces? Where is the mask that worked so well, the carnival, the puppet master who held my strings? My strings. Here was my arm as it reached out a hand to you to express love, to rid itself of love. Here was my mouth in which breathing forced awake the unending sounds of blood, of ink. So each made of himself a net, a grip upon place. Such as this present I can summon here with you. Here, now, remember that. I see you nowhere. I hear you nowhere. We are on different pages, not a different story. The ancestor, the divided cell, keeps asking, have you heard the nightingale? No, have not. Listening now is few and far between. Mostly it is more opaque, not talk, not thought, but like it. But you are still standing there, so very bright, my past. Hello. Dear Fission, myself isn't working for me. It's involved with arithmetic. It's trying to correct itself so that it fits, to slice itself, dismember, unremember, cut off, so on, recall, until it can be counted on or in or up or down. It says some right fit must be found, restored, resolved, bought up, doomed to. It must be worn more artlessly, the new thing they will call the self. We must not make the same mistake again. What was it was mistaken, ask the vigorous winds, bending down gently as if to lift us up, right through our throats as fish used to be hooked when there were fish. For nothing is more important than this new face that must shake the whole thing down and laugh and bring up the rear. What time is it? Are we already in the necroscape? Even as a machine, I recall the dust and ash, which everyone assured everyone else was just a small digression. And from the very end of the book, Many happy things will have happened. No, truly. Child conceived and learns how to walk and good things happen. A little prayer for the end. Poem titled Poem. I really gotta change my head around to read this one now. That last poem has me shaking, it scares me. Okay, it's good to be scared by poems.
the earth said, remember me. The earth said, don't let go. Said it one day when I was accidentally listening. I heard it. I felt it like temperature, all said in a whisper, build tomorrow, make right the fall. You are not free. Other scenes are not taking place. Time is not filled. Time is not late. There is a thing the emptiness needs as you need emptiness. It shrinks from light again and again, although all things are present. A fact, a day, a bird that warps the arithmetic of perfection with its arc passing again and again in the evening air, in the prevailing wind, making no mistake. Your indifference is your principal beauty, the mind says all the time. I hear it, I hear it everywhere. The earth said, remember me. I am the earth, it said, remember me. I had to take my mute off so you could hear the applause. I suddenly panicked, I thought I'd done the whole reading on mute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Jory, for that reading, and thank you for this book. And uh, I think there's a link in the chat, so y'all can start buying it right now. You don't have to wait. Uh, you know, we're just going to talk, so you can buy and listen to us at the same time. I um, and I really, uh, I really do. Um, you know, I'm a fan, so <laughs> I'm really. Um, I told you this on the phone the other day. I'm just really taken by this book. And I don't know how you feel about it, but you're a person who, at least for the first half of your career, if not continuing on, often when people wrote reviews of your book, they would talk about film and your own experience with film. And they would talk about how, if you have an understanding of film, you would be a better reader of Jory Graham's poems, right? And um, it's really interesting to me reading this book because if you need that history of film, this book seems I mean, it almost seems like it's a book of poetry in a genre that's sort of something like horror or sci-fi. Uh, there are poems that are clearly spoken after the apocalypse um, with a question of whether or not we are in the, the apocalypse. Uh, questions, a uh, poem spoken by what seem to be cyborgs or robots, poems spoken from um, the ether into this world or spoken to the ether. Uh, to, to children in, uh, in, in utero. Um, and so I just wanted to talk to you about where real meets the surreal meets the imagination. Sort of thinking about Stevens or thinking about Miwosh and maybe if they were having an argument, where would they land on Runaway? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, think about the science fictive aspect of it is uh, one of the troubling things and I think a lot of environmental um, scientists have sort of um, sort of you know asked us to think about this and to undertake some kinds of projects that each of us Glory. did you did you put something in front of your speaker on your computer did you put something on top of your speaker you sound no okay that's better that's better. I think you got a little farther away. I'm listening. Oh, it has little blue lines all over it. I don't know what that means. But. Yeah, you, you don't sound as clear as you did before. I didn't Almost like maybe something. Is, not, is anything on top of your laptop? No? I haven't moved, no. Okay. What, what but I, mute again. Does that work better? That's better, I think, yeah. 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You were talking about environmental. So that the that the um, the thing about um, the science. So much of of what we read about climate change, and so much of what people experience when they uh, read the intelligent news about um, what the next few decades hold. Um, Mark Linus's new book called Six Degrees, um, uh, an updated version of his earlier book by that name is really worth reading. Um, feel like it is almost impossible to Im hold in mind. So it, it has a science fiction quality to it. You know, these scenarios that are described to us that we're supposed to take on board in order to undertake serious action, make sacrifices, ask, um, ask our children to make sacrifices, uh, imagine um, uh, seven generations ahead making sacrifices. I mean, how do we speak to that? And so part of uh, what I feel is, although I, I do steep myself in the science, I try to make the poems feel as unfictive as possible. I sort of feel like um, I'm trying to combat the science fictive aspect of, of uh, a lot of what is in just in the regular scientific description in a book like Mark Linus is about what one degree of change or two degrees of change will do. So in fact, um, I've tried to make a, a speaker coextensive with these events. It's hard to tell sometimes in the book where you are, as you were saying, in terms of what might have happened um, mm -hmm. already and what hasn't happened yet. And the speaker has vertigo and the speaker, the speaker has, you know, one of the things about the way we live now is we can imagine our parents, our grandparents, and many of us live in in situations culturally where our great grandparents are still summoned either via photograph or anecdote or because they passed down some kind of wisdom and we can go back in time at least three or four generations and it feels natural to us we can even sometimes go back to a saying that our great great grandparents said that our that our parents carried forward our features our characteristics we are told that we resemble people from the past and so the dead have a certain ancestral quality that they can um, that it's approachable by us and that, that going back in time is in fact most of the great nonfiction books that are written today that are interesting to people like Peter Brennan's the end of um, the ends of the world are all about deep time and paleontology going back in time we can go back in time what we've lost is the ability to do the mirroring mirroring activity which is so crucial which is imagining as the Iroquois used to be able to in the, you know starting in the year 1140 I believe and moving all the way into um, into 1500, they used to have these, you know, what the term seven generation comes from, which is imagining um, um, that the decision we, what the decision we make today results in, in terms of direct life experience, in terms of energy, food, but also relationships for people seven generations ahead of us. We can't imagine our children, grandchildren, and then it's sort of it drops, it disappears. So we turn, we term that fictive when the imagination goes in that direction. And we start to create all sorts of scenarios. So what I'm trying to do is move the ability to think realistically in the direction of the future as if we were seven generations out, maybe looking back, maybe in a vertiginous sliding back and forth among those seven generations, maybe 10 even ahead of us. And, and bring it to life as if it were a, a reality which we inhabit now, which we do. I mean, almost all the stories that I've uh, in, included in here, people um, disappearing under the earth, mm -hmm. under the soil, they actually, you know, that's based on um, um, houses and friends disappearing under the soil, um, children disappearing in mudslides in Santa Barbara um, two years ago. So, I mean, none of this is fictive, mm -hmm. I guess is my answer. But... Um, the, the other part of your question is film has remained a huge influence on my life and the studying of editing in particular and the working with filmmakers when I was young. So the way in which I splice things, the way I move, I always know is, uh, you know, I, I owe a debt of gratitude to Eisenstein and to the studies that I undertook when I had to work on a moviola and hold up film and, you know, manage to figure out how to uh, edit one piece onto another. Those those were invaluable lessons. I wish every poet could study film editing. It's an incredible um, gift. So so speaking of editing, you sort of mentioned during the reading, you, you held up and you showed us that the book is in quatrains. Much of the book 
is in quatrains. Can you talk about the decision as to why, so, why you're sort of drawn to the quatrain in this book, these really long line quatrains? And maybe you can also talk about often there are poems that are um, justified right instead of justified left a few times, maybe not often, but a few times there are poems justified right instead of left. And then I wanted to add to that a question. I hadn't ever noticed this before because I was never, anytime I've seen you read, I've never read along. And you really do read the line, which you don't expect necessarily because many of your lines have what some might think of as unconventional line endings, right? That end in the or end in of, right? And yet you do make the necessary pause. Even if you have a word like in befall, you know, you had a pause uh, right at that hyphen. Uh, can you talk about a uh, form in this book? Well, um, the quatrain is a wonderful, the quatrain is a wonderful, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, the ballad and the hymn, come to us in, um, in, the, in the quatrain. And um, obviously they come to us primarily in tetrameter, um, sometimes in pentameter, and these lines are much longer and I could address that in a minute. But um, they share the sensation of, of um, whether it's the ballad or the hymn of, of an audience um, that's congregate, that, con that congregates. Um, there's a kind of, moving together and um, being moved together that happens um, when you're undertaking, whether it's a hymn or being part of a community that is, is, uh, is telling itself one of its ballad. And um, so, you know, that feeling that these poems are not only sometimes written by a communal self, a self which is part of a community speaking on behalf of that community ballad, but part of wanting to enter and be itself a community, many selves that break apart, that have to hold back together, that have to find a new skin. The idea of, of, of having a skin is, is prevalent throughout the book as a kind of net holding it together in the way that a hymn will hold the congregation together. So there's something exciting about that feeling. Going beyond, there's a special valence you get from going beyond the tetrameter. Um, and um, I mean, obviously, we think of the pentameter as the ideal line for human breath to utter speech, which is why our plays are written in it. And once you get into the hexameter, you get into a line which is Vatic and which you, whether it's Blake or Whitman involves a kind of, a, you know, a, a expression of vision, which can be still encompassed. This line has a runaway quality to it, which is that, you know, there's more than you can take on board um, that you have to take on board. And that feeling of having to still have line integrity. And the reason I, I read the line breaks is that I, I need the line breaks to make the music when I'm, when I'm writing the poem. So, I mean, those line breaks are for, they're, they are, as my teacher Donald just used to say, they're not line breaks, they're lines, first of all. And he hated the term line break. And, and this idea that, but there is a kind of strong landing spot with the greatest essential stresses on that left-hand margin. And so the, the idea that you could move the, uh, the energy in that direction and keep momentum going for poems of this kind in, in, in which things are fragmentary and often, you know, multiple speakers at once to have the kind of uh, momentum that will carry the poem forward syntactically is very important. And if you didn't have the line break and the stanza break, what I love about quatrains is the first line you enter into the quatrain and the last line you exit back into the silence. But in the middle, you have two full lines to play with, you know, what's interesting, what's very difficult for me about couplets, I think I've very rarely written in couplets, is that every line is either a first line or a last line. So every line is negotiating with silence in this dramatic way, breaking it or re-entering it. And so um, as for the, um, so the, the, the feeling of the quatrain, the, the idea that um, um, the, the hope for communion of a certain kind, congregational activity of a certain kind uh, I think is involved with that. As for moving them, some of the poems to the right-hand margin, it's a thing we take for granted as poets. When you, when, even in discussing the quatrain just now, the left-hand margin outside of when it breaks the silence at the very beginning of the poem is actually a very silent place. It can be awakened um, through prosody by extreme stress or a certain kinds of feet that break on the beginning. But it still is an automatic place that we go back to and we don't feel ourselves spring forward in the line. 
Okay, we don't feel ourselves elastically pulled forward into the white space on the right hand side. But if you start writing with a right hand margin, which is a, has a kind of terrifying effect. It's um, once it's set by the machine that you're working on, um, it's, it's abstract, it's mathematical, it's like the end, it's like a wall, it's like a cliff you go off, whatever it is, just bump into it. And then what happens is when you pull back towards the left, you feel this enormous energy and um, it, as if it takes, it's, it's an almost unpleasant, you know, pulling away from the, from the limit, from the edge, from the place that you just, you know, the end. And, and, and then you, as you move back towards it, you spring back away from it and it activates the space you move into towards the left in a way that the space you move into towards the right is not activated. I mean, it is a very interesting effect. Obviously the, the, meta, the central metaphor, it has to do with the runaway. Um, I mean, in the book, runaway is obviously runaway climate change or runaway inflation. And there are runaways and children who are among the 70 million migrants wandering our globe right now about to turn into vastly larger numbers just desperately looking for a place that just to, to just to be allowed to live and to have the, the right to any kind of life but it's also runaway capitalism and runaway uh, inequality and runaway uh, carceral state and I mean all of them are represented in this acceleration um, which is a, a greater acceleration from the last book uh, fast and uh, I think probably it sped up so much I could no longer, I had to, you ha I had to have the quatrain to hold it mm -hmm. and the right hand margin to just nail it because otherwise I couldn't have handled the amount of, uh, the amount of uh, simultaneity um, the, that the speaker's experiencing. Yeah, the second time I read this book, I read it over long to my friend Tarfia, the poet Tarfia Pazula. And because um, she was working on some poems, and I was like, "Oh, I'll read you these Jory Graham poems, and they'll help you write poems." I promise. And she kept saying exactly what you're saying. It's as if she could envision, though she wasn't looking at them, she could tell that the form had changed just by what you were saying when we would discuss the poem. So it's really interesting. Last question I just wanted to ask before we turn to uh, the question from the audience just had to do with um, just had to do with something that you just mentioned. And that is, you mentioned while you were reading Despair, and then you also mentioned hope, um, and how you sort of, you do move toward hope, I think, in that, in that last poem. Can I read you a passage from, uh, I love this. Um, we shall be standing, no, surely in 2044, we shall be standing in the field again, tending, waiting to surprise the God who thinks he knows what he's made. Well, no, he does not know might be a small cavity, but it guards a vast hungry. How bad does that hurt you, fancy maker? You have no idea what we turned our back on to come be in this field of earth and tend, yes, tend these flocks of minutes whispering till the timelessness in us is wrung dry and we are heavy with end game. Have I mentioned the soul? how we know you hustled that in, staining all this flesh with it. So there's a, um, even, uh, <laughs> there's this human will. You know, I feel that in thought too. You know, this human will toward memory. I mean, memory's doing a lot of work. Uh, there's a tree earlier in the book. There are no trees anymore. And so people have to have trees by way of memory in the book. And so I'm, I'm thinking about that. And then as I turn the pages, I get to Sam. Can you talk about who Sam is and why Sam is an important um, character, I would say, in this book? Well, first of all, I would say that the piece that you just read, um, which you read beautifully, is one of the most pissed off pieces uh, in, the, in the book. Um, and uh, one of the things that um, I feel the book, in, I hope makes one feel, I'm not gonna get to Sam in a second, is, um, you know, really would you have wanted to live at any other time than this time? And what this book says is no, you know, this was the time that I was born, that we were born to live into. And what an extraordinary opportunity we have. We have to reimagine our relationship to time itself. We have to reimagine and kind of undo our relationship to whatever we thought we thought history was. We have to invent um, a, a kind of humanity that we haven't 
perhaps yet uh, um, managed. But you know, when I find myself um, in the book most despairing, it's also where the energy comes from to say, no, you will not, um, you know, you will not destroy us. Mm -hmm. you know, we are going to survive. Mm -hmm. And we're going to survive through all kinds of transformations, including things that are surreal in the book. Mm -hmm. But they are, you know, the book is an exercise in this tool that we need for everything else, namely imagination. Um, you know, we need it to invent our way out of here. We need it to imagine our way out of here. We need it to hope our way out of here. We need it to make our way out of here. There are many poems that are just about what it was like to have work. You know, are we really going to be become people who, you know, live on a basic minimum income and are told that we are no longer supposed to have, you know, the, not just the dignity of work, but the sheer uh, right to a vocation, you know, um, let alone all the other basic uh, human. Um, so, so the anger in it uh, springs into a kind of um, ruthless um, hope. Um, it's not a sort of, uh, it doesn't expect answers, but it sure as hell expects um, that, to be able to find questions. And uh, so I think that that's part of it. Now, Sam, you know, I'm planning to put together the four books, Sea Change, um, Place, Fast, and Runaway into the four eco books that sort of go together as one book. And I was thinking about it today, about how in this book, Sam, my granddaughter, Samantha, is born. And... Um, She's in utero, she comes from the invisible into the visible, she's from the unborn into the born, and that transition is such a miracle um, that it makes, it shines with everything that's miraculous about even the most ordinary things. Sam's birth and rain are equally miraculous mm -hmm. in these, um, mm -hmm. my refrigerator is making this gigantic noise. I hope you guys can't hear it. I don't think we hear it though. We don't hear it. <laughs> we don't hear it. I promise we don't hear it. Hold on one second. Make sure that. Hold on one second. Jory's going to get a sandwich out of the refrigerator. <laughs> oh my God. It's as if it's like coming alive and trying to talk to us. Anyway, um, there is a poem in here that's an interesting poem to me. It's mysterious. The second poem after Sam, Sam's first steps. And uh, she's, it's called Sam Standing. And it's the only poem in which the, there's a, end rhyme, A, A, B, B, C, C, all the way through the, uh, the, the end. And, and the truth is I write many, many poems with end rhyme, and then I revise them and bury the rhymes in the middle. I'm not too fond of the rhymes, which I use a lot of inside the poem, uh, ending on the line, end. But in this particular poem, for some reason, I couldn't remove the, these couplets um, these two two heavy little rhymes at the end of it. And, it, you know, it, you always think poets know what they're doing. I, I had no idea why until one day I was looking at thinking, oh, you idiot. This poem is about her learning how to take her first steps. And so obviously you want to give her an A and an A, and then you want to give her a B and a B, and you're giving her the end rhymes to help her walk. So, you know, that, there's that kind of feeling that... Um, um, the world is, you know, there is a tragedy in that moment that the human becomes vertical. They enter the world in a very different way. They enter mortality and temporality in a different way. In her first steps, she suddenly, you can feel her feel the sudden vacuum behind her, which is the place that she's now, you know, left where she will no longer ever again be. So minutes are awakened and time is awakened and, and therefore everything, the consequences of it in a very real way. But um, those are moments of extreme mystery. I mean, I guess I would equate anything that can remain mysterious and thrilling and sort of, you know, uh, shiny with uh, unknowing is, uh, is exciting and uh, makes one very happy to be alive. So we should take some questions. I know Ben said he would do it, but we, it's 7.56, I think, and I want to look at some of these questions. Um, uh, can you talk? I think you did... I think we talked about some of, you answered a lot of these questions. Do you have, uh, did we, I think we know the answer to that. Uh, what, uh, I think you answered that. What was the name? Oh, tell, um, remind them of the book you mentioned that was about deep time. Oh, Peter Brennan's The Ends of the World. It sounds depressing. It's one of the most thrilling books you ever read because it's really about, um, 
you know, the five prior, you know, we've had this, we are in the sixth extinction, but the five prior worlds that went extinct, what each one, or almost went extinct, um, what each one of them was like. And one of the things that you realize is um, uh, they, they, uh, they were, they were in many ways much more extraordinary worlds even than the one, the creation that we live in. And that there's a possibility of a whole other world that would emerge out of this one. So Deep Time is a very, that many people who write in Deep Time, it happens to be a particularly fun book. I mean, I've also been reading Robert McFerlin, who's just, I think is a complete genius. Absolutely everything he writes. So. <laughs> He's probably married. I would, I would recommend Robert McFerlin who absolutely um, is, you know, his most popular, uh, big bestseller now is Underworld, but um, all of his prior books, starting with his first book, um, will make the world so endlessly mysterious to you in ways that could, I mean, the same, you know, things that are right in front of you that, you know, you um, don't necessarily see until you see them. I have a few poems in the book which attempt to do that. In one poem, it's really just absolute stillness um it, it's sort of in late summer light i suddenly saw stillness and uh it's one of my favorite poems in the book and it's an, a, a poem filled with a kind of um or brimming joy it has a lot of the feeling of that what keats gives me into autumn of this feeling of what it's like to uh, to inhabit the now outside of time if you could find the present tense and then get, you know, take away all of the paraphernalia of the past and the future I was talking about and just inhabit the sensation of being um, and remove yourself from it and feel presence as such, um, you know, which we work with meditation to do, but sometimes just looking and describing Marmon McFarlane manages to live in the now like nobody else I've ever seen. Amazing writer. So I have, um, there are some questions that are about some, a lot of people asking questions have, have obviously read the book, Jory. Uh, and I sort of had some of these questions too about the shifting you, uh, sometimes in a single poem, a poem will begin in an I and suddenly that I will become a you. Uh, sometimes the you is definitely an other and sometimes the you is an I or an any person. Uh, even in Thaw, the first poem you read, I think there's an I at first that seems to become a you. Um, and then that you, Y-O-U, uh, sometimes is only the letter U. Uh, the other question I see coming up has to do with the use of question marks. Uh, sometimes you ask, there are many questions throughout this book, but they don't necessarily end in question marks. And yet poems will have question marks in them. So that's a, so can you talk any at all about any of that and uh, decisions you made as related to uh, changing yeah. pronouns or point sure. of view? used by poets in ways that have nothing to do with the way it's used to organize prose. And uh, I think the question mark is a really loud device, like the exclamation mark, which you don't need except for when you need it. Um, and I feel, I feel like I don't want to amp up the tone. I'm very concerned with keeping the tone under control so that I can modulate it and make clear, like when you read the lines that you read, you, know what, you knew what tone of voice to read them in because it's built into the poem. It doesn't have to be, you know, imagined or imported. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, and, and there are many, I remember, you know, one time when I was much younger, I gave a poem to the New Yorker and they added, um, it was the poem, What the End is For, I think it, it is. Mm -hmm. And they added 27 pieces of punctuation to it, the, the fact checkers, the proofreaders. And, uh, and I just about had a nervous breakdown, the punctu you know, but they argued with my punctuation so I had to go justify it. For example, I use a dash and a period or a dash and a comma, or, you know, and those things you, you will, if, if you need precedence for them, you know, you have to give them Elizabeth Bishop or you have to give them somebody else who uses these pieces of punctuation. As for the I and the you, um, you know, you don't need philosophy to tell you and you don't need, um, you know, and you don't even need John Ashbery to tell you that you are an I and a you and a he and a she and you are all these things at once and, you know, um, and we don't even need to be living in a moment when many of us feel like we are complicated in our sense of how we identify ourselves. So um, without even going to those arenas, the feeling that I can become my own you and that my own you can become actually, in terms of situations like fear or moral accountability, a they or an us, um, is a freedom that I think we've been taking in poetry for a long time. I'm certainly not 
the first one to do it. And, uh, you know, and, uh, I don't do it ironically. Um, I do it um, with, a, with great, you know, John uses it more ironically, um, John Ashbery. And um, I just feel like it's a natural state of being now for us to feel that way. And so why not use it? As for the smaller you that one is, it's just not because we text or we do Twitter or whatever, but you know, sometimes you are you and sometimes you are the whole you and you, you know who's showing up. And so, uh, you know, poem, poem, the imagination is a place where all of those textures are, uh, are available and I, you know, nobody's gonna give me like six colors to paint with. I want the entire, you know, um, um, spectrum. So I, and I don't think anyone's confused. It's just like, why the hell is she doing it? You know, that's a different question. My question would be, does it feel good? Mm -hmm. When you read it, does it feel like, yeah, I get why, and then I feel it. If, if your conceptual intellect gets involved in going, well, why is there a Y-O-U here and a U there? Um, I would say get rid of the conceptual intellect and just read it and go, hey, does it feel like this U should be and this other one? Yeah, well, don't, there's no have to have a reason for it. Feels right, sounds right moves right and you can feel it and you know why and you can't give yourself the answer to what that question is that's great why do you think it is that we know that in every other art i mean it seems like we understand how intuition and feeling work um we listen what we listen to songs with words and we don't understand a word that the singer is saying and yet we're attracted we know the tone of the song we watch a dance we see a piece of visual art but in poems pe people are really like what the hell do you mean by this instead of that? Do you understand what I mean? And yet in all other forms of art, people sort of take, I mean, seriously, I really, people, you don't watch, you do not watch Alvin Ailey thinking, well, what did that kick mean? Do you, do you follow them? And that's not, I mean, I, there must be something about poetry in particular, though, that well, makes- anything, anything that uses language is using an instrument that is being used by so many other um, uh, activities in the society. It's not just that it's used by prose and by literary prose and by um, newspapers and, you know, by news articles um, and by, you know, all sorts of um, social media. It's also used for propaganda and for uh, lying. And, you know, it's a very complicated entanglement, this thing that we, that we manipulate when we, uh, the short answer to what you're saying is that's why music matters so much in poetry and why you know, I work so hard when you tell me that the break, you know, reads as a break, that your friend can see the form when hearing it. If the music isn't right, then the, the reader will start doing that, which you just described with the questions. On the other hand, you know, our, our job as poets is, as many have pointed out before, to, uh, to cleanse the language of its other uses and to revivify it and to make it an instrument for moral accountability for political, for spiritual accountability, for, you know, um, every other kind of accountability. And, you know, we need a fresh instrument. It's not, you know, you don't need, um, you know, a 20th century critical theorist to tell you that, you know, the collapse of the German language is part of, goes hand in hand with the, the rise of the Weimar Republic. You know, there's, there's just ways in which the, if our language is capable of so much lying and so much deceit, more now than ever, and so, so much, uh, it's not, it used to be advertising. Now it's like everything that comes out of people's mouths for the most part. Then our job is to make it accountable, clear, crisp. You know, when they say don't use a cliche, there's no rule about not using a cliche except that the person will feel it again as if from scratch. And the, the function of the poem is to make you alive again, as, or as Octavio Paz would say, to, uh, to live as if you're missing a skin in, in ever more ancient and naked states. And, you know, we have to get back to some of our naked states in our language as well. Thank you so much. We're going to go back uh, to Benjamin now, but let's give uh, a sort of virtual hand to one of our great poets, Jory Graham. Thank you, Jory, for doing this. Thank you, Jory. Thank you so much. I really do like this book, and I think it will be of great use to you and to your future. So please get this book. Thank you so much to the both of you for such a wonderful conversation. This was such a great way to spend an evening. Um, I just, again, wanna take a moment to thank our wonderful speakers and all of you in the audience for spending your evening with us and continuing to show up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. 
please make sure to check out Runaway at the link below. I have also included a link to buy to the tradition, Jericho's book from our website. Thanks again for your time and your support and for spending part of your evening with us. Have a great night, everyone, and stay well. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone.